And here we go at the Church of Rock and KSKQ. Yeah. Okay. So go. Here we go. He's probably one of the most underrated bass players ever, in my opinion. Uh, he is the bass player for Sham 69, one of the most successful punk bands in the United Kingdom. But during his career, he's been a member of the Cherry Bombs with Andy McCoy and Nasty Suicide of Hanoi Rocks. He was a member of the Wanderers with Dave Parsons from Sham 69, uh, Rick Goldstein of Sham 69, and Stiv Baders of the Dead Boys. And of course, uh, the Lords of the New Church with Stiv Baders, Brian James of the Damned, and Nick Turner of the Barracudas, and many others. Uh, yeah, he's done a lot. He's one of my heroes. He's, I'm incredibly honored to be chatting with the legendary Dave Traguna. Dave, thanks for being here, man. Hey, no problem. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. You know, I saw your name pronounced two different ways, man, everywhere I looked, with a U or an A. What is the correct one? Um, well, they're, they're both used. Um, it was kind of a weird thing. Um, I, I guess, uh, to cut a long story short, um, I I looked at one point, uh, my my name was Trigana with an A, T-R-E-G-A-N-N-A. Um, but at some point I found my father's birth certificate and his name was with a U, which is more traditionally the um, spelling of the name as it's a Cornish name. Cornwall is a, a used to be a Celtic part of Southwest England, similar to Wales. Um, so at, at some point, I I adapted that as kind of a stage name, and it was a little bit as well um, to do. Stiv got into numerology, and he worked out that um, my nickname from Sham, which which had been Kermit, um, worked out to a good number nine or something, and and I wanted to drop that name. Um, when when I teamed up with Stiv, that that um, nickname, and just used my my name, so I said, well, actually, Trigunna comes out to the same number in numerology. So, and I told Stiv, you know, about the story of my that, which should really have technically speaking been my name. I guess for some reason it went wrong on the birth certificate. So that that's really where that um, anomaly comes okay. from. I, I was using Trigunna, but of course, m m real name Trigunna, and. Um, there you go. So it's both are correct in some way. Interesting, man. I uh, myself am into astrology and, uh, of course, a lifelong fan of Stiv Bader. So that's a really cool thing to find out. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, because that was one of my questions. How, how did you get the nickname Kermit? So I guess we know that now, right? Or no? Well, yeah, that was from um, <laughs> in the very early days of Sham. Um, there was a picture of me in one of the music press, Sounds Magazine, I think it was, and we had uh, um, some of the road crew back then were a little bit obnoxious and, um, you know, had a lot of banter. And one of them said, he looks like Kermit the Frog from the Muppets <laughs> on that ship picture and it kind of then they all started nicknaming me Kermit. So it kind of stuck for a while. Yeah. OK, I get it now. Yeah. Uh, how did you start playing bass guitar originally, Dave? Um, w with my hands. <laughs> <laughs> no, awesome. seriously. Um, it was a, that that was a, a just a bit of a fluke, really. But when I, I actually joined Sham Sixty Nine um, to be potentially their rhythm guitarist, and um, they just recorded their very first single with John Cale um, producing. And when they were recording that, the bass player at the time, Albie Slider, um, he couldn't keep time on the bass. So um, I think Dave Parsons has actually played the bass on that. And when 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 I joined, there was just about sealing the um, deal with Polydor Records. So Polydor wanted to record uh, a live show of Sham 69 and they said, look, we can't have Albert playing bass. And I, I, me having just joined and done two gigs as a rhythm guitarist, um, they said, what are we going to do? You know, it's a, and I said, well, you know, I had a bass guitar for about two weeks once. I can probably, you know, adapt to that <laughs> so that we do that. And that's what happened. The first time I ever played bass um, on stage, it was recorded and, and is the first side, uh, well, the, the live side of the first Sham album. Ah, interesting. <laughs> so I, I had to teach myself as well. So, 
Okay. How old were you when you joined Sham then? I think I was 22. I was the I was actually older than the other guys. Okay, wow. I thought you were younger. That's wild. Okay. Makes sense. Um yeah. so you guys originally intended to keep using the name Sham 69 once you kind of fell apart and broke into the Wanders, is that right? Um, no, well, when Sham split up, I think in 1980, um, when you got Jimmy still, went like, off to do solo, and, and the three of us, me, Dave, and Ricky, said, let's get another singer in. Um, and the, the record company were not really that keen on um, doing an album with Sham 69 without Jimmy. So when we um, got in touch with Steve, and Steve agreed to come and be the singer, of, of a new form band, um, we had to think of an, another name. I think for a little while we were going to call ourselves the Allies, and then um, we came up on the name The Wanderers. That's awesome. And that was a really good band. Did you have a good experience in that band? Yeah, it was quite short-lived, but the, and the album didn't go down that well because it wasn't really in the... Um, in the in the vein of Sham 69 or the Dead Boys, it was something a, a little bit different. Now it stands up the test of time, I think, and a lot of people are really appreciating it, and it's quite a rarity. Um, but um, yeah, it, it was only quite short lived as well. We did um, gigs in England and we did a tour of the states, um, but that that was about it, really. It's interesting that the English press uh, for a bit called you guys like Dead 69 or the Sham Boys. Yeah, I guess they did at that time because it was three of Sham and one of the Dead Boys, yeah. You know, I didn't know that, just on, on a side note, I didn't know that you also had done some acting. I, I was I was looking through some history in like the North Shore movie, uh, Samantha Fox video. Um. I I don't ever think I've done any acting. <laughs> so it must be it must be a different Dave Tragana then. <laughs> well, I did the sh I did the um video with Samantha Fox. Okay. Oh, okay. I see. Uh, just a music video then. Yeah, I was just you know that at the time, um, our manager said that you know Samantha Fox is recording a single and they're looking for some kind of like glam type rockers, and um, the Cherry Bombs I think had just split up so. Me and Nasty agreed to do it. Andy said he didn't want to do it. Um, and uh, uh, an old buddy of mine that was actually the original bass player with the Cherry Bombs, Timo Caltio, um, the three of us, um, and I think Terry Chimes as well, yeah, from Cherry Bombs was the drummer. And we just had to mime in a studio, you know, on stage playing along as her Samantha Fox's backing band. Interesting. What about the North Shore movie? There's no connection to that? I don't know that movie. Okay, that's strange. Yeah. Um, Where did uh, you see that, Derek? It was sitting right next to the same info about the Samantha Fox on IMBD, I believe. Okay. Interesting, huh? Yeah, <laughs> I'll have to check that one out. <laughs> I also concerning uh, the cherry bombs. Is it true that you guys performed many Hanoi rock songs that had not been recorded by uh, on any of the Hanoi albums? Um, it's then again, I couldn't tell you that for sure without checking myself. It's so long ago now. I know that we did. Uh, we were doing songs. Obviously, Andy wrote n nearly all the songs for Hanoi Rocks, and so it's more than likely that. Maybe he had some songs in the pipeline uh, that were, you know, intended for use with Hanoi and that he just, we used them with the cherry bombs, I guess. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, yeah. Why, yeah. You, why did Andy McCoy fire singer Anita from the cherry bombs originally? Do you know? It wasn't really that he fired her, I can say, because um, we, after they had a, the, one of the last gigs on the U.S. tour that we did in New York, um, they had a bit of a um, <laughs> an argument. <laughs> and um, after the gig, uh, Billy Idol came in backstage and he was like, Anita was upset and Billy Idol was consoling her and she went off with Billy Idol. 
I think he took her to the Caribbean somewhere and that was the last gig we ever did. So it wasn't really that, you know, it was discussed that Anita was fired. It was, you know, that was a breakup. And, and because we hadn't got the, the, the record companies um, signing us or anything and, and whatever happened then, you know, it, it kind of fell apart at that point. Yeah, imagine Billy Idol walking off with someone's girl. <laughs> well, it wasn't. She wasn't anyone's girl at that time. Oh, okay. She wasn't just Andy's band. girl. Just the band's girl. <laughs> Our singer, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, for those who don't know, uh, the Cherry Bombs, of course, was formed with uh, former Hanoi Rocks guitarist Andy McCoy, Nasty Suicide, and also Clash drummer Terry Chimes. Uh, so that was an interesting band that I really dug, yeah, that's man. that's right. It was a little bit weird for me because um, I, obviously I, w I, I was in Lords of the New Church, you know, and um, we, we'd been gigging and gigging and gigging from like 1981 to 1985, constantly on the road. And we'd never, ever had any statement of royalties from our manager, Miles Copeland, who is um, who managed the police and was Stuart Copeland, the drummer, the police's brother. Um, yeah. And we'd done a gig in Japan and on the way back from Japan in the plane, we all said, right, look, we've really got to get a meeting with Miles and demand that he shows us some uh, accounting, you know, because he'd never accounted to us. He just kept saying, you know, you boys haven't recouped yet. And so we said, well, you know, we've been selling albums, blah, blah. At least let's see some figures, something. So everyone agreed. So we set this meeting up. When we got back to London, um, I considered that the other three really capitulated to Miles because at, at, at this meeting, Miles Copeland produced an A4 sheet of paper with three facts on it, amount spent, amount recouped, therefore amount that you guys still owe. And and I, I was going, well, that's not proper accounting. How, how do you justify these figures, you know? So I, I was really pissed off. And at that time, um, Andy called me and said, look, um, we need a bass player for, for Cherry Bombs. Do you want to do it? And I said, well, you know, I'm committed to the Lords, but, you know, I'm really pissed off with the Lords situation. So I went and um, had a chat with Stiv, who was sharing a flat with Mike Munro at the time in Fulham in London. And um, Stiv was not in a very good state um, at that time. He was doing a lot of um, chemicals <laughs> and... Um, he he wasn't happy either, but he said, look, if you've been offered that with Andy, why don't you do it? I, I, I understand why you want to do it. So with some, you know, heavy heart, I left the Lords for the Cherry Bombs. Interesting. I didn't know that. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm a very big fan of the Dead Boys. Were you and Stiv close friends, obviously? Well, um, we, we, we'd we met each other. Um, Shan69 had um, been out in, I think, maybe the first time we went to L.A. Um, we hooked up with, uh, we someone took us to the studio where I think it was Kim Fowley actually was managing a band called The Orchids, an all-girl band. And somehow we, through Ricky the drummer, we got hooked up with them. And he said, Steve's recording in the studio. Um, Steve was doing songs for his disconnected album so we all went into the studio and got on really well with Steve um Steve came to see us I think as well in New York once uh Sham 69 so you know I wasn't big friends with Steve but certainly you know we we got on well when we shared same space in the recording studio and um yeah, so when we needed a singer, we thought of Stiv, but we thought, what's the chances really that Stiv's going to come over to England? You know, he's based in um, in America and he's doing solo stuff, but we, we got in touch with him on the phone and he, he said, yeah, man, I really want to do that. I love Sherm 69. You guys are great. Yeah, let's come over and form a band. Wow, interesting. So that was the Wanderers. That's how that so came about. Was Stiv Bader's one of the more wild rockers you've ever spent time with? Um, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Can't <laughs> deny that. Yeah, Stiv was a, um, yeah, a bundle of fun. Um, a, you know, a great stage man, and you know, would do many wild, different things. You know, like surfing on the top of the, 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 the band's 
bus on tour, you know, he'd climb out the window when we were going 70 mile an hour down the motorways in England and stand on top of it. And that was one of his things. He got up to all kinds of tricks. He was always like, I think he, he really loved the Three Stooges, you know, the, the American comedians. Yeah. You know them? Yes, of course. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes, I do. Yeah, so he was always like into pranks and um, winding people up and doing funny little things like that. So, but he was definitely wild, yeah. I heard that, I don't know if it's true or not, but I heard that on one occasion that one of his stunts on stage actually resulted in his clinical death for several minutes. Do you recall this? Well, he, he, he did this trick with a um, microphone cord where he would wrap it round a beam if there was one, you know, in, in whatever gig we were playing. And he had a way of tying it where it looked like he was hanging himself. And, I, you know, on a, it was more than one occasion it went wrong slightly. But I think there was one occasion where he, he apparently was clinically dead. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's pretty wild. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was always, you know, not only on stage but off stage as well. He was always pulling little stunts. So he was one of the real ones, man. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, and I didn't do as much research as I should have, so I admit it, but didn't you play guitar, or I'm sorry, didn't you play bass guitar on the Johnny Thunders K Sarah Sarah 1985 album? I didn't actually play bass on it. I, I, I just happened to sing on it. We, we went down the studio when he was recording. Um, I th me, Steve, and Mike Monroe, um, Paddy Paladin, and um, I didn't play the bass, but I, we, we did one track, I think it was Endless Party, and we just, um, we did kind of these backing vocals. Interesting. Wow. So it's backing cool. vocals on one of the songs, but yeah. Very cool. I'll have to play yeah. that on the radio show. Uh, I know that uh, Miles Copeland decided that Lords of the New Church was going to cover Madonna's Like a Virgin. What did you guys think about that idea when he first proposed that? I didn't want to do it, nor did Brian. Um, so Steve, Steve took it as a way of doing a novelty version of it, perhaps? Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, hang on. Just, wait, just, just one second. No problem. I'm in the middle of that interview. I'll, I'll call you back. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I again, um, it's not something that I really wanted to do. Um, I just thought it was a bit cheesy. But um, in the end, uh, Miles mainly got, um, I think it was some guys from the Circle Jerks to really? partly record that. And then we, I think we did did it in the end, We, we me and Brian, did agree to to play on it, but yeah, it wasn't. In hindsight, it was. I guess it was okay, but it. it I just thought it was a bit, bit too cheesy. Yeah, that's wild. Um, I always wondered the story about that. Uh, do you happen to have a favorite song by Lords of the New Church, and what is your favorite Sham sixty nine song as well? Um, well. I'm terrible when people ask me what favourites because I always think, well, I haven't got one real favourite above all the others. I like different songs for different reasons. But I guess um, with with the Lords, um, it's a song that I've I've done in other bands as well where I sing Russian Roulette and I really enjoy singing that. Um, so that's one of my fave tracks. Also, um, Dance With Me, I really I like that one. Open Your Eyes, um, yeah. With the right, Lords, um, with Sham, I guess it would be Borstal Breakout. <laughs> a classic. Kids United. Yeah, great stuff. Um, have you ever considered writing an autobiography, Dave, or have you? I have considered it, yeah. And and a lot of my friends said, yeah, you should write one because you've got so many stories. But, um, yeah, I, I'm, I, if I do it, it will be maybe in the next upcoming few years. It'll take me a long time. My problem is that my memory's not that brilliant, so I have to try and piece everything together. When did this incident occur? Where was that? Where were we when that occurred? You know, and things like that. So if I do it, I want to get the facts right. So I'll have to 
look up a few people and get corroboration, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I can relate. I really can, man. I can relate to that. Yeah. Um, I want to say thanks to Graham Williams, who uh, orchestrated the interview today. He's a great guy and uh, very cool. He's helped me out a bit. And Graham, uh, I think he... Th he might have set me up. I don't know, but he asked me to ask you a couple of questions. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. I mean, Graham's doing Chan 69's merchandise at them now. Can as you know, he's, he's he's doing a really good job with that. Him and his um, Mrs. Sue. Yeah. So shout out to them. And he, I wanted yeah. to ask you, what is the story? Uh, who is Peter Rush, the sulfate strang strangler? Ah, oh. <laughs> Pete Rush, the sulfate strangler. He, he, do you know Ian Jury? Yes. The blockheads. He's, yes. he's, he was Ian Jury's minder. And, um, you can, you can catch him. He's in a film called The Cook, The Wife, The Thief, and The Lover. Um, so, but he's this giant of a guy. And, um, he, at some one point we we were doing a few gigs in in England with Sham 69 and um for some reason he he ended up being the the driver of the van you know and he was a really odd character a wild guy and um we started off the journey from London he he had a handful of pills and washed them down with half a bottle of vodka that's the kind of guy that he was and off we set down to to do these gigs and the one incident that you know really sticks in mind was um when he was driving at, at night after one of the shows driving us back to the hotel in cardiff which is in wales and um he was driving erratically and nearly everyone demanded that he stop the van in this pedestrian precinct in, in <laughs> cardiff and they got out and i i i was a little bit inebriated to say the least. And I said, I'm going to stay and, and calm him and make sure he doesn't do anything else. And he ended up parking this van in this big car park and started going around, ripping off the um, windscreen wipers of all the parked cars. And um, oh. at, so, at one point um, the police had been called and they kind of found me in the middle of this car park. And at that point, Pete Rush had kind of disappeared. And um, the police said, you know, you've been ripping. I said, it wasn't me. It was this other guy, the guy that was driving us. I was just trying to get him to stop and calm down. And at that point, Pete Rush appeared in between two of the cars and, and the police took one look at him. He was a giant of a guy. He had like big fuzzy hair and earring, about 20 earrings in each ear, which was a bit uncommon then. And he just looked at the I said, that's the guy. He looked at the police and he went, Grrr! sort of some growled at them and, and went off. And the police didn't even bother to chase him or anything. And I got put in a cell for the night. The next day, we got a call from the hotel where the crew had been staying and saying there was some damage to the hotel. And we asked what was the damage. And the, the landlady of the hotel <laughs> said, well, there's engine oil all over the sheets. And apparently what had happened is after he disappeared, when the police had failed to apprehend him, he'd, he must have been totally out of it. He'd seen a, a VW camper bus and he had one of those back in London. And his story is he wanted to take some part of it. So he crawled underneath it and accidentally undid the oil sump and all the oil came out and covered him in oil. And then he said he, he, he passed out. And then he said he was woken up at six in the morning by someone kicking his feet. And he hauled himself from under this van, rose to his six foot six high, covered in engine oil, looking like a, 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 a giant from medieval times. And the guy that had kicked his feet just ran off. He went back to the hotel and got into bed without taking his oily clothes off. <laughs> So that that was a really amusing incident, yeah. <laughs> I can't quit laughing, man. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's a great one. Yeah, but I think he did. He was doing so many speed pills and so much alcohol. Unfortunately, yeah, that was his demise. You know, so he passed away quite a long time ago now. But yeah, if you ever want to see what he looks like, check out that film if you can. The cook, the thief, the wife, and his lover, and Ian Drury's in it, and you'll see which guy he is at one, in one of the scenes because the way I've described him, you can't miss him. 
<laughs> Thank you for that tale. I'll do that. Yeah. Um, I'm running out of time, unfortunately, but gosh, I could talk to you for hours. Um, uh, I guess I'll ask you one more. Um, uh, it's another story that Graham set up and I guess it's probably worth exploring. Um, <laughs> can you tell me the story with the Chateau and the fire extinguisher and Jimmy? Ah, yes, that was another one. Um, we were recording the album Hirschen Boys in France in a studio um, called The Chateau. Um, uh, lots of, you know, my boyhood heroes had recorded there. Elton John even had an album called Honky Chateau. Um, Bowie had recorded there, and it was a, 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 I think it was owned by Chopin or one of the, you know, classical guys in the, in the, 1800s and it was um, a very spooky place anyway and um, we were recording there and we used to record you know sometimes into the early hours of the, the night and um, my girlfriend and I at the time I think probably about you know one o'clock in the morning we said you know we're going to go to bed and we we went over from the recording studi studio across this courtyard into the um, quarters where our bedroom was up these creaking wooden stairs it was all quite spooky and we got into bed and we'd been just kind of I think you know just lying there reading or something uh, in bed and um, at the foot of the bed there was this great big wardrobe big with big oak doors you know real old-fashioned type thing and um all of a sudden, you know, we'd been in the bedroom 10 minutes, no one else had come in. All of a sudden, the wardrobe doors flew open and this fucking, oh, sorry, this smoke came <laughs> out into the room. And both me and my girlfriend, we, though we were lying down, we'd like jumped so high. Well, I think we jumped about three foot off the bed, you know. Think, what the hell's going on? It was Jimmy Percy and he, he specifically known before we you know we said we were going to bed he'd gone into our bedroom took a fire extinguisher and hid in the wardrobe and then waited there for about 10 minutes without <laughs> saying anything uh, and then suddenly burst the door open and let the fire extinguisher off and it was one of those f uh, smoke ones you know <laughs> <laughs> the most scary thing ever you know because it was such oh. a creepy place anyway <laughs> 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 wow so you didn't stay in that room that night or maybe you had to wait till the dust settled <laughs> no we, i think we stayed there after beating jimmy up <laughs> <laughs> that's funny yeah. dave yeah well there, there are always tricks going on you know i could probably go on for another half hour at things that both steve and jimmy percy they were both people that loved you know playing pranks on the band and stuff yeah, you know, they're both legends as well. And uh, I really have a lot of high respect for Jimmy Percy and Stibaters. And uh, the only reason I haven't interviewed Jimmy is because he doesn't do interviews. But in other words, I'd love no. to talk to him. It'd be great. He's, but, he's a, a real eccentric character. Well, I love him uh, and all you guys. And thanks for all you've done in rock and roll. And uh, you just, just don't know. I grew up in the 80s and 90s, always listening to Lords of the New Church. And, you know, I met a guy yesterday who saw my Facebook post. He's 20 years younger than me. And he's like, the Lords of the New Church, that's my favorite band. I'm like, wow. Uh, what yeah, a yeah. Well, I, I read that, you know, that I thought we did some great stuff. And even when I listen back to the albums now, I think, you know, that they haven't lost anything. I, I still really think we did some good stuff. And I think, you know, we were underappreciated, to be honest, I think. Um, but, um, you know, it's a it's a, a legend band. I'll tell you what, not only were you guys killer on stage, but you guys were the coolest looking band around. You guys dressed awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We took we took pride in our appearance. Yeah, we were always trying to find all these you know cool clothes to wear, and yeah, we 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 definitely were into the the image, not for the image's sake, but just for for wearing clothes that we liked. You know, yeah, we're different. It, I could tell you guys were all the real deal. It was great. You weren't just playing dress up on the weekend, and that's why I connected. No with way, no. Awesome. Well, Dave, um, I hate well, to we, cut it. We, we certainly didn't go down very well with a lot of places we stayed in America, you know, because just because of the way we looked. Gee, imagine that. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> well, Dave, thank you so much for making the time to talk to me today. I hope we can do it again down the road, but uh, hopefully I'll catch you guys live when I'm over in the UK in September. Yeah, yeah, get in touch, you know, definitely. Absolutely. Thanks for making the time for one of your fans and for for the, uh, one of the last independent uh, community rock and roll radio shows in America. Great. Good. Keep the flag flying. I will, brother. Thank you so much, Dave, and all the best to you and yours. Yeah, and to you and yours too. Yeah, you take care, yeah? Okay, take care, Dave. Cheers. Cheers. Bye.